Hello, everyone. I am back. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, we're doing something slightly different today. You might notice there's someone in the background, and he'd be next to me if there was more space behind the desk. This is Dr. Alex uh, Zarifis. He is a lecturer at the University of Nicosia with in the information technology area, but he has an expertise in innovation, and he helped us put together the slides for this week's presentation. Certainly all those theoretical frameworks are above my pay grade. So he is here to help uh, to the degree that there are questions on these innovation topics and to make sure I don't get stuck and bring his expertise uh, to bear. So well, let's say hello to Alex as well this week. Hello everyone from me too. Um, Bitcoin and digital currencies is a very interesting area. Um, I, I really wanted to get involved both in teaching and doing research in this area and have an opportunity like you to learn more about it. Excellent. So we will get going. This is session 11 of the University of Nicosia MOOC in Digital Currency. Today's topic is innovation and innovation as it relates to Bitcoin. Uh, we have a couple questions that came in earlier today, but also, by all means, throw questions into the chat. Uh, and otherwise, uh, Alex and I might just cover some topics we think are relevant. So the first question was about anti-fragility. And specifically, do we believe there's two parts of the question? Let me, let me take the easier part was do we believe that there are other altcoins that are exhibiting the same S-curve, uh, moved up the S-curve as Bitcoin? My short answer is no, I don't think so, not yet. Um, that doesn't mean it won't happen. That doesn't mean there won't be other altcoins that do this. But if you look at the market capitalization or the amount of activity or the amount of merchant acceptance, on the altcoins that are more or less uh, close coins to Bitcoin, none of them seem to be doing move, picking up steam the way Bitcoin did, and that's understandable. It's uh, even Bitcoin itself is very uh, new and early stage technology, so I wouldn't be surprised if you don't see a second fast follower right now. What we might see is completely different approaches like Ethereum or things that haven't been invented yet that also start to take a big role in digital currency. But for right now, within the very narrow reading of the question, I would say, no, it really is Bitcoin that's moving up the S-curve. And my guess is where we are at the S-curve is still at the bottom part. We haven't hit the exponential growth part. We might be right at the bottom where the curve is starting to curve, but we're certainly not heading straight up just yet. Um, George mentioned to me that he's having some trouble hearing. We don't know if it's his connection or is it general. Is everyone else okay on the audio? Okay, great, let me continue. So JR's other question was about anti-fragility. And you know, do we believe Bitcoin is anti-fragile? Let me pull up the specific uh, question. And anti-fragility is a very interesting concept because it's not like it's something that is very well defined. It's not like there's a standard definition. There's not even something that's an accepted broad concept in any particular field. This is, it, the term was invented uh, by Taleb. He was the guy who wrote Black Swan. He is a combination finance, ex-finance guy slash economic philosopher slash mathematician. Um, and 
one of his ongoing themes and topics is what types of systems perform well under unexpected events, if I wanted to simplify it, and what systems look good, look good, look good under regular operations and then blow themselves up. And the way, one of the ways he's tried to formalize this concept is with anti-fragility. So let's talk about first some non-Bitcoin examples of what might be fragile, what might be anti-fragile, and then see how it applies to Bitcoin. And by the way, I'll give away the answer in advance. It's not like we can come to a particularly certain definition either way. This isn't like a check the box concept, and it's somewhere between an intuitive concept and a well-defined concept. I, I think it's somewhere, it's somewhere in the middle. So one of the major analogies, and you know, Talib started talking about this in the context of the finance world, is about investment strategies that are picking up nickels in front of a bulldozer. So what, is, what does that mean? Let's say you're selling puts on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and most of the time you get a little bit of money, everything goes okay, you think you're really smart. In fact, this is so stable that you say, well, you know, maybe I should lever up the strategy. I've looked at the last five years of data. It's never gone outside of these parameters, so I'm going to do this at 2x what I was doing before. I'm borrowing money to do it. Oh, and that worked pretty well, so let me go on 4x. And now you look pretty good. Investors like your performance. It's stable, it's steady, it's within parameters. Everything is looking great. And then the market crash of 1987 happens. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average drops more than any of your models have seen in 60 years. And you're bankrupt. That's something that in financial terms, Talib would say, is an anti-fragile strategy. It is not well suited to unexpected events. And you're taking a lot of contained upside risks. Your upside isn't gigantic, but there is a gap for a massive downside risk to come bite you. You can even think about it. One of, one of the, let's think about it now in non-financial terms. And one of the important points to understand about anti-fragility, the opposite of fragile in his concept of it is not robust as you might think. So let's think about how we use these words conventionally. If I had a ancient Chinese porcelain cup, that might be very fragile. I mean, if I knock it off the desk, it would be likely to break and it's fragile. So you think, well, what's, what's the opposite of that? Well, you might think something that's robust would be the opposite of that. So something that's strong and made out of metal and, you know, your car, let's say your, your Jeep, your Land Rover, it's robust. Look, it's tough. It's the exact opposite of a porcelain cup. But the Jeep maybe is not, in fact, anti-fragile because all you need to do is unexpectedly roll over a nail in the road and the tires deflated and now it doesn't work anymore and you've crashed your Jeep and now even the seemingly robust thing is actually broken. So it doesn't respond well to unexpected external stressors. An example in kind of terms, you know, the system that I would always think about as being tremendously anti-fragile is the internet itself. And, you know, and it was in fact you know, designed that way. And you know, this is an often repeated story, but it's true. The original structure from the Department of Defense when they designed it was meant to be robust enough to survive a nuclear attack against the United States. And so in the design of the internet, it's deeply decentralized and it moves around different pathways. So it's not that there's one central um, pathway that if that gets knocked out, it's going to disrupt the whole system. It will work its way around even if there's only a few pathways left and find its way there. It's less efficient on a per hop basis on at some times, 
than just saying I'm going to go in a straight line from A to B. But in aggregate, it's extremely, extremely robust. I will. I saw this in person in, on 9/11. So I was in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, I saw the towers hit, and instantaneously, both the cell phone lines and the landlines stopped working because there was just both a ton of volume and one of uh, AT&T's or Verizon's network operating centers got knocked out. The only communication mechanism that worked for that whole morning in Midtown Manhattan was the internet. It was super slow. There was some big nodes did in fact get knocked out by the crash, but it didn't get through. The way I was able to communicate with my family was through the internet, not even through the landline. So this is the general concept. And so then the question is, well, does this apply to Bitcoin? And it's a very, very good question. And there's a what level do you want to take this, this question at? Certainly at the simplistic level of the protocol itself, I think it does meet a lot of these criteria. Uh, it's decentralized. There's not a single point of failure. Um, there's no particularly obvious way uh, for one party to shut it down or deeply, deeply hurt it. Now, then you take a level up abstraction and say, well, it's come under a lot of pressures. There have been questions about... So now we're talking about the overall system surrounding Bitcoin, not just the protocol. And... Here you come into questions like 51% attacks or wild currency swings or governmental interference. All of these things that bugs, there was a bug early on, all of these things that are stressors to the system, it seems to have managed them pretty well. And I think some of the things that people might say about it, there's a lot of people who have skin in the game. Uh, in Bitcoin and everyone's incentives in the way the system is set up seem reasonably well aligned to get people to do the right thing. I doubt they're actually perfect, but reasonably well aligned. And so I would say at the broader ecosystem protocol, ecosystem plus protocol level, yeah, pretty good. Now, again, there's no hard definition. Someone asked Talib himself what he thought about Bitcoin. He said, this is a the thought of a decentralized, denationalized currency was a very good idea. Something like this should exist. It's important. He doesn't own any Bitcoins yet. He doesn't have a strong opinion of if the system itself is the absolute perfect way this should be done. And he wants to observe it and come to his own intuition of how he feels about it. So, you know, a fairly neutral to positive answer, but he liked the overall concept of a denationalized currency. So that's that's kind of my view on it. I think it is a reasonably in that direction. And as far as anyone can say, I'd say it's generally anti-fragile. Take a break to check the questions. Yes. Um, Hold on, Alex, move a little closer. Yes, well, I, I agree with everything Andoni said, and that, that, that is the key, that's the heart of the matter. I just add two small uh, dimensions to that. The first is, as examples in the slide talk about BitTorrent, one characteristic of a resilient technology or system is that it has real value. So, and um, digital currencies like Bitcoin do offer a real value, um, which helps them in, in this sense. Another aspect is from the consumer's perspective. Uh, so for a digital currency to achieve broad appeal, people with limited understanding should adopt it. And as long as um, d digital currencies like Bitcoin overcome the challenges they face, um, the consumer will um, trust them more and more. <coughs> I just want to add those two points to what Anthony said. Great, thank you. That's fantastic. Um, JR asks, is B 
BTC more anti-fragile than the internet itself since it has survived so much interference and the internet did not have to deal with early on? I'm not sure. Remember, the internet took a very, very long time to develop. It was first a research project, I think, in the late 60s at DARPA. And so spent decades without much broad consumer uh, interaction or appeal. So what we've seen is much faster technology cycles on anything internet based. So you have a compressed cycle because there's an, there's an already an existing base of uh, networked users. And so I don't know if, if Bitcoin really has had more interference per se, or if it's just that's adoption cycle is much more compressed. So things that if they were happening over 20 years might seem spaced out are now happening over the course of months and years. So I, I think it's been, it's been a normal enough beginning to a new technology. A lot of new technologies are very controversial at the beginning. Um, I want to talk a little bit about disruptive technologies um, because to me this is one of the frameworks most relevant to thinking about Bitcoin. And I want to talk about this in three parts. One, what does it mean when you see a disruptive technology and let's talk about some examples. Two, what does this mean kind of more narrowly in the last few years in tech? And three, how does this touch into what we're seeing with Bitcoin? Disruptive technology is or tend to follow a couple of characteristics that makes it very confusing for both the incumbents and the general population to properly evaluate them at the beginning. As a general rule, they are not better than the existing technology. That's what's very interesting about them. So in a, on a normal product cycle, in a normal market structure, what you see is companies competing with products that are incrementally better than their competitors' products. Oh, I have a car. You now I've now put power steering. Oh, now I have power windows. Oh, now my engine has 10 more horsepower. These are the type of incremental improvements that you see in a typical market structure. And on any given day, the market participants have similar products and the ones from this year are a little bit better than the ones from last year. And it feels normal. It's mostly what you interact with as a consumer. Disruptive technologies tend to actually be worse at most things. And then either or much, 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 much cheaper or much, 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 much simpler. And so examples that have existed over the years, there's even Japanese cars in the 70s in the United States. They came into the US, they were small, did not have a lot of features. This was still within the glory years of the large American car. And they were basically laughed at. The only thing they had going for them is that they were quite a bit cheaper. And they sat at the very bottom of the marketplace and bit by bit worked their way up. Same thing happened in steel with what are known as mini mills. So the U.S. had very uh, high quality steel mills that produced very high quality expensive steel. And many mills worked at the very bottom of the marketplace with uh, secondary uses of steel. They were ignored by, um, uh, by the traditional players. Again, bit by bit, moved their way upwards. We see this all the time in tech. It's easy to forget now, but when blogs first came out, when internet communication first came out, they were laughed at by traditional media. What is this stuff? This is a bunch of poorly written, unedited, 
stuff written on the internet by people who aren't vetted to write it? How would this ever be a threat to the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or Times Magazine? Don't you know we have a hundred years of tradition and high quality editors and Pulitzer Prize winning authors and writers working here? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. That's all that on day one, on any given day, you had an internet blog post was probably worse than an article in the New York Times. But what was different, what was new, the cost of publishing, creating the content, delivering the content on the internet was much, much, much cheaper, much, much, much simpler, and much, much more accessible. And so what ends up happening, and this has taken 15 years, but bit by bit, the quality has gone up on what used to be people's you know individual personal blogs and now you go read blogs by leading people in different fields or you have online only media companies that are creating content of exactly the same caliber as the traditional organizations and the problem for the incumbent in these scenarios is that the person that has a natively lower cost cost structure once their quality level comes up suddenly is extremely, extremely, extremely dangerous. And so think about it again, it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget this. If you wanted to compete in publishing articles to people in 1990, you needed a printing press, you needed delivery, you needed um, editors. It was a huge capital investment. Very few people could do it. Most newspapers ended up being monopolies for that reason. And so the people now come in with, that can just log on somewhere, enter a content management system, write a post, have a structurally superior cost structure. They just cannot be the incumbent has a very hard time meeting their cost structure, which means what in effect? They can undercut on price and they start eating up from the bottom and they're very happy and can operate on much lower revenue, much lower margins. <clears throat> and because they have this structurally better cost base, they can improve their quality bit by bit. And by the time the quality catches up to where it is okay for the average user, their cost base is still a fifth of the incumbent and the incumbent's doomed. And that is, it's a very, very tricky problem for the incumbent because the incumbent basically has his or her hands tied. If they say, well, I'm just going to go meet the new guy on price, their cost structure won't support it. So they tend not to be able to compete on price. So they say, well, I'm going to compete on features. Well, if they start competing on features, they start getting more and more complex, possibly more and more expensive. And, you know, becoming relevant to a smaller and smaller part of the audience that needs all those features. And all of a sudden, they're boxed into a small, high quality corner of the market. You know, we see this all the time. You see this with MP3s and CDs. Most MP3s for most of the time that you've had MP3s have a lower quality than CDs, but you know, they're faster, they're cheaper, they're easier to move around and they've more or less wiped out the CD market. And this is venture capital, early stage investing is very much about looking for these types of disruptive technologies. And one of the examples that, one of the words that several well-known venture capitalists use, uh, Chris Dixon has talked about this, Fred Wilson has talked about this, when they're looking at technologies, is look for things that today look like toys um, that are misunderstood, that look like that could never be a serious business and think through how the pathway can develop. A much more modern example of this has been Airbnb. When Airbnb was first launched as a company that let you rent, I mean, think of the name, an air mattress on in someone else's living room, air bed and breakfast, people were evaluating it as, well, what's the market for 
sleeping on air mart mattresses in people's living rooms. Well, sounds pretty small. Sounds pretty uninteresting. Sounds like something that maybe some college kids would be interested in. I don't think that's a big opportunity. The more visionary investors, and it's funny, this was viewed by Fred Wilson as one of his greatest misses, and he's usually very good at this stuff. The more visionary investors said, well, no, it's going to start there, but once you have this concept of effectively trading accommodations, you're really building the eBay for temporary accommodations, and it's going to go from air mattresses to become rooms to then become whole apartments to then say, well, aren't the small bed and breakfasts going to start using this to move their inventory? And so four years later, Airbnb had more was delivering more nights to travelers than Hilton does. So in four years, they are they became competitive in size, not yet in revenue, but in size, number of nights people stayed with Hilton, which has been around for a hundred years, has tens and tens of billions of dollars of capital investment in their various real estate. And so this is one of the things that makes me personally so confident about Bitcoin, because more or less everything you hear by the doubters of Bitcoin are things like there are things that sound like classic incumbents looking at a new technology. Oh, why would anyone use this? It's difficult. Why would anyone use this? It's missing this feature. Who would ever need to send $10 from the U.S. to Nigeria? But I don't think this is ready for our customer base, which are customers that like to use Chase Bank. And that's, that's where you hear from the incumbents. And then on the flip side, what you see in the technology, it has the characteristics that have been very successful for other disruptive technologies. It's very inexpensive to use, and it's open, and it's decentralized and robust. And so all these characteristics increase the chance that over time, people are going to build the features needed to fill in the gaps. And you're already starting to see this, and this will continue over the next 5 and 10 and 15 years, that looking at Bitcoin at a static level, saying, oh, well, here are these things that are missing now versus the existing system. It has a volatile exchange rate. It's a little bit technically complicated for your grandpa to use. All of these things are things that will change over time. And to me, that's the fact that it meets this kind of pattern that you've seen over and over in disruptive technologies is one of the most interesting things about it. Uh, that was a little bit of a long monologue. See if Alex, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, I, I think uh, I'd have to agree with that. It, it's a big topic. We could talk about it a long time. I think yeah, we've covered it quite well. Um. George gave me a quote. Hold on one second, I'm going to read this. Merciers Hubbard and Bell want to install one of their quote-unquote telephone devices in every city. This idea is idiotic on the face of it. Furthermore, why would any person want to use this ungainly and impractical device when he can send a messenger to the telegraph office and have a clear written message sent to any large city in the United States. This is from Western Union Telegraph. Then the Michigan Savings Bank said about Henry Ford, quote, the horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty, a fad. Just like the um, famous, the famous quote in, um, from IBM before it dramatically changed its mind that the worldwide market for computers was maybe five computers. Um, you see this all the time. You see this all the time. I suspect you're going to see a lot of these quotes 10 and 20 years from now uh, <clears throat> being 
said about Bitcoin in retrospect. Uh, Paul Krugman, who is a very strong economist, and I mean, he was a Nobel Prize winning economist, also made this mistake with the internet. He said the internet wasn't likely to have much more of an impact on productivity than the fax machine. And again, it's the same issue of looking at it from a static perspective versus looking at it from a dynamic perspective. If you looked at the features in the internet as of 1998, you might think, okay, well, this is really about email or maybe communicating a little bit of information. So I guess it kind of sort of looks like a fax machine when you don't want to make a telephone call and you can send an email, you could fax it or you can email it. And this is the fact that in an open platform and an open technology that can be developed, um, the there's really no limit to what you could put on the internet. And now we're having video chats as we're doing now and a hundred other features on the internet. The, um, all right, George is asking me a question. Give me one second. Let me pull him over here. George is asking, what are the implications of user-driven innovation in Bitcoin versus business-driven innovation in other technologies as well, 3D printing, operating systems, et cetera? I think I understood. I think if I understood the question correctly, uh, that's what it was. To me, these aren't necessarily distinct. They are anytime you have open systems where there can be permissionless innovation. That's a commonly used catchphrase where you can say, oh, I can start building an application that uses technology X, whether it's TCP IP or Bitcoin or 3D printing, and I don't have to go to a gatekeeper and check first if I can use it. Um, I think you will see a much, much faster pace of innovation because what you have in effect is a gigantic worldwide R&D lab, which is all the individual users trying innovative things. And then the ones that pick up traction usually end up getting pulled into a business style format and then get scaled up and blown out in a business format. There are some very minor exceptions that didn't go that way. Uh, let's say Wikipedia that stayed as a small in staffing nonprofit foundation. But as a general rule, what happens is the user driven innovation is the big R&D lab later for the business driven innovation. And you definitely see a pattern where open technologies tend to generate much more innovation faster because you can tap the brain of everyone in the world who's interested in this. Um, one of the things that you hear VCs talk about a lot and started talking about about a year ago, they're seeing a lot of the most talented developers spending a lot of time on Bitcoin, getting excited about Bitcoin getting excited about Bitcoin before anyone else was excited about Bitcoin. And they say that's a that's tends to be an indicator, a sign that uh, they tend to, developers, even though they can't articulate why they're excited, very often are a good leading indicator of what things are going to be interesting. The other thing, by the way, that they were they're saying about 12 to 18 months ago that developers were excited about was 3D printing. And I suspect it will turn out that both of those are going to be hugely important, fairly open in both cases, platforms. Alex, I have a question for you. Yeah. I'd like to talk about the S-curve right. a little bit. And I'd like to talk about how does one start to think about, are you on the S-curve? Are you not on the S-curve? Is there going to be an S-curve? Yeah. Because the bottom of the S-curve is pretty tricky, right? The bottom of the S-curve is kind of flat. Bottom of the S-curve doesn't... Yeah. The bottom of the S-curve might just be the beginning of a flat line, and then that's not so exciting. And then usually, from a personal perspective, if you want to be involved in something interesting, by the time the S-curve is shooting up, you might be a little bit too late. So part of taking advantages of S-curves is to try and figure out 
when these flat lines are S curves and when they're just flat lines and how does one even think about these topics? Yeah, that's a good question that's at the heart of uh, this lecture. And one of the ways to appreciate when you're moving up the S curve is the different types of adopters. And you re like I was saying before, you really want to get the average consumer and um, so you get the critical mass and get a, w a wider adoption and um, usually the average consumer has a different perspective from the innovators that adopt it at the beginning they have less specialized knowledge and they're more cautious and they're kind of waiting to see what happens and um, personally I I've conducted research into this and the, the, the average consumer, apart from the discussion we had about anti-fragility, they want to see Bitcoin keep going and keep, up, uh, to keep overcoming its uh, challenges. They also want to see uh, big names that they know and trust getting involved. So for example, we had Dell. Uh, accepting Bitcoin payments. That's exactly the kind of thing that uh, Bitcoin needs to get this wide adoption from people that aren't specialized. So I think there is one very important point there and then I'm going to ask a question about a different one. We, I think Alex is saying really when you expect to start taking off on this curve is when you see the things that actually make it accessible to quote unquote regular folks who aren't super technically savvy, probably don't have any political inc inclinations in how they want to use it, and um, just want it to be easy and work. And you see this, by the way, in Bitcoin that there's often some tension between uh, some of the early adopters of Bitcoin who will say things like, well, if you don't keep your private key yourself, you don't own your Bitcoins. I mean, Andreas Anova said this earlier in the course, and that's accurate, by the way. But my guess is, for the average consumer to adopt Bitcoin, they're not going to be doing long, complicated steps with their private keys. They'll probably be using an online wallet. Um, if you see large, consumer-friendly organizations start to use it and e simplify it, that's probably another indicator that you're heading up the beginning of the S-curve. Now, I had a question, though, for the very front of the S-curve, when you're in the stage maybe we are now. Is it possible to distinguish between a flat line that's just going to be a flat line and a flat line that is going to curve up by seeing what type of people are there at the beginning? If it's a diversified set of people, maybe it's just an average product, that's flat. If the people using it tend to be the type of people who use exciting new technologies, people who are thought leaders, in the case of IT, that's often thought of as the developers, is that maybe an indicator that it's an early adopt? The reason the line's small still is because you have early adopters, not just because the market's limited. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're generally speaking about indications here, of course, and I, I'd have to agree that that would be an indication, and it's very reasonable, and it fits the pattern of other innovations. Yeah, and the discussion you had uh, earlier about the, the broadness of the people getting involved um, and the specialists, so, it, yeah, it's an indication. All these things indicate a more positive future and a bigger uptake in the future. Interesting. Yeah, I think for me, and I think you see this a lot, and you follow top VCs, they do look for this. It's important to, if you're trying to understand, is it a toy or is it a limited market product or is it something that's going to develop, it's very important to understand who the early users are not just to count them up numerically and say, this is how big the user base is. Okay, I have another couple questions coming in 
via George. One of them I'm going to take because it's an easy one. I think I'll knock it out quickly. How could Moore's Law affect the adoption of Bitcoin? Uh, Moore's Law is the observation made in the early 60s that computing processing power tends to double at the same price point every year, which, by the way, generates an absolutely astounding exponential curve in price performance. Anything that's doubling every year means you have 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and pretty soon you're at 65,000. Um, and what has been the case, this has been observed since the very early days of technology, back in punch cards, all the way to now, Moore's Law has held in computation and you see variations of it both in disk space and in networking speed. Um, I would answer the question in the opposite manner. I think Moore's Law means the concerns that people sometimes have of, oh my God, the blockchain is going to get too big because it will be, once there are too many transactions in it, are... A red herring. I don't think it's going to be an issue. Um, the number of businesses or technologies in the history of IT that ultimately failed because disk drives couldn't keep up or processors couldn't give up is pretty, pretty rare. And I did an analysis uh, with a gentleman two or three months ago of even assuming extremely aggressive growth in transaction volume that basically consumer grade hard drives would easily keep up with the growth of the blockchain. So I would say Moore's Law is less one that is going to push Bitcoin forward, but it will eliminate barriers that might have otherwise emerged if technology and the price performance of technology was static. If it was static, you'd eventually, I think, run into some significant issues, but it's not. And um, I feel pretty comfortable that's not going to be an issue. Um, related question, what other S-curves could be built on top of Bitcoin? Could another technology take over Bitcoin's adoption in the process? Absolutely. I mean, this is kind of core to the thesis of why Bitcoin is such a big deal is that it's programmable. And so when you're looking, I view Bitcoin's base adoption, which is a combination of how many people hold Bitcoin, how much hashing power there is, how well distributed there is, how friendly the regulatory environment is, how many, how stable the exchange rate is, all of these things are a base level of infrastructure for then more complex applications to be built above it. Those might be colored coins, they might be smart contracts, they might be complex financial institutions built in code, they might be different forms of speech. And that to me is one of the reasons this is so much more exciting than if it was simply, hey, it's a currency and a currency only. In many ways, it parallels what you see in the internet. So we're in the phase, the equivalent phase, of people getting online and people getting computers and people being part of a global network. And there was just simply no way for the average person to predict in 1993 how many additional businesses will would have been built on top of the internet and how quickly they would have been built. I mean, because, you know, in the dot-com boom, which everyone thought was the epitome of the internet really driving an option, there were only 50 million users online. Today, you have a billion users online and much, much faster speeds, much, much more capable devices. In many cases, the devices are now carried around with us in our wallet, uh, in our phone, and so, what you see is businesses, gigantic businesses, being built much, much faster, particularly in communications, than they used to be built in the past. Uh, people can get to 10 and 50 and 100 million users in a few years. What I think Bitcoin will allow, and this is once it is broadly adopted, is those same types of businesses 
on the financial side to be built quickly on top of Bitcoin. But it is going to take time for the base level infrastructure to get in place. The estimates today are there's four or five million Bitcoin wallets. That's the internet in the mid 90s, maybe the early 90s. And there, there was a very interesting article I went back and read a few years ago, and I read from that time a few weeks ago, where someone in Time Magazine was ranting about how people are overestimating the impact of the internet because he went and redid the calculations and could come to the conclusion that the internet wasn't 4 million users, it was only 2 million users. And that means it really wasn't that big a deal because people were maybe even just sharing their internet connections and so we could stop paying attention to it now. And I laugh because these are the exact same discussions you see happening right now about Bitcoin. Well, the wallets aren't really as many as people think. Oh, there's duplicate wallets. So oh, why isn't the wallet growth exactly this fast? And I look at this and I said, oh, I've seen, I've seen this movie before. I've seen this movie in the mid 90s. And over time though, it will be a platform for a lot other, a lot more other, a lot more additional businesses to be built on top of it. So I, George, I think this is fundamental to the thesis of Bitcoin. Um, and I think part of why it's drawn such a broad interest. The next question is, are there other elements beyond the exchange rate of Bitcoin to USD that could be used to substantiate that Bitcoin is an innovation following an S-curve for adoption? The answer to that is absolutely yes. And it's very interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with Pantera Capital, which is uh, one of the most heavily invested financial services firms in the Bitcoin ecosystem. They hold Bitcoins, they hold investments in Bitcoin businesses, including Bitstamp, uh, released an index and its name escapes me. And it included a variety of factors about Bitcoin adoption, except the exchange rate. Because you notice most of the publicity, you know, it's like watching the stock market go up and down, tends to focus on the exchange rate to dollars or the exchange rate to euros. And I think they explicitly left the exchange rate out to make the point, well, there's a lot of underlying operational factors that will also um, be leading indicators of its establishment. And so what could those factors be? Hashing power, number of wallets, merchant acceptance, number of transactions done every day. All of these things are indicators to look for. And you know, some of them have bounced around the number of transactions and the trading volume, because it tends to be linked to, it has historically linked to the exchange rate, you know, or below the peak in December of 2013, when there was a lot of trading and excitement in China. On the other hand, wallets are continuing to grow at a steady rate. Merchant acceptance is continuing to grow. So I think these are very important factors to look at, probably in many ways, much more important than the exchange rate and certainly things that will predict uh, ultimately broad acceptance, which in some ways drives exchange rate. And we talked about this multiple-sided market where all of these things work together, having users hold Bitcoins, having merchants accept Bitcoins, having miners mining for Bitcoins, having investors buying Bitcoins. They tend to work in a virtuous cycle and impact each other in both directions. Give me one moment to pop into the chat. Okay. Next question. Gabriel Tard, who who first plotted the S-shaped diffusion curve in 1903, defined the innovation decision process as a series of steps that includes first knowledge, forming an attitude, 
a decision to adopt or reject, implementation and use, confirmation of the decision. And the question is, which steps would you think are hardest? Which step would you think is hardest for Bitcoin to jump toward the next? I think Alex and I should both try answering this and see if we say similar or different things. Yeah. Um, sorry, what, what were the steps again? First, knowledge. Yeah. Forming an attitude. A decision to adopt or reject. Implementation and use and confirmation of the decision. Yeah, my, my f it's a very good, qu it's a simple question that for me doesn't have a simple answer, but it's a good question to discuss. The fir my first thoughts would be that uh, this would work b better for a very specific service or product. Uh, when you talk about Bitcoin, you t we're talking about something that has a number of uses. It can be used in different ways, so it's, it's like you're talking about a number of different services or products. And as we're at the beginning, at relatively early stages of its adoption, uh, the way it links into other things changes. So I think it's it's difficult um, to talk about it as in in the, with in, with these steps that have been mentioned because we're going through all the steps in a sense at the same time. Um, yeah, I think that's. Those are my first thoughts on this. Well, that's a much more intelligent answer than I was going to give. I actually agree with that. That makes a lot of sense. When you talk to average consumers who aren't enthralled by the technology or the politics of Bitcoin, the first question I do often get asked is, what is this good for? Why do I need it? Why do I want to use it? Right? And then for people to make the leap to actually do, do something with it, they they need to latch on to one of the usage cases. And by the way, one of the usage cases for a lot of people has been like, oh, well, I'm gonna make money because it's gonna be an investment, right? And that's one of the things that has driven a lot of people to buy some Bitcoins. I think if I go back to these steps where we are clearly with Bitcoin, the general technology is somewhere between first knowledge and forming an attitude. There's still quite very many people who haven't heard of it or they have heard of it in passing, and they certainly have not, for, a lot of people have not formed an attitude at all, or have very simplistic, rudimentary views. Oh, is that the thing used for drugs? Um, so the further Bitcoin gets on these two dimensions or steps for its general protocol, its general brand, let's say, I think it becomes then helpful for specific products and services that use Bitcoin in the phase of a decision to adopt or reject. So if you've already come to the conclusion that Bitcoin is a good thing, it's something you'd be comfortable using when someone develops a service based on Bitcoin, I think your decision to adopt or reject would be much easier to make. If you think Bitcoin might be scary or illegal or uh, dangerous, it might not matter if I've gotten myself a really great, if I built a really great service for micropayments or a really nice remittance service because the user, the potential customers have already thought, I don't want to be involved with this. This is, this is somehow negative. So I think it is very important for the system as a, the ecosystem as a whole that people are pushed forward on you know, knowing about it in the first place as possible, developing an accurate attitude about it. Um, I wouldn't say positive or negative, but just accurate. And then that will make the adoption rejection decision, I think, much easier once specific products and services are introduced to potential consumers. Um, We have two minutes or three minutes left in the session. So we have time for maybe one more question. Um, I will say that Alfred Jordan is saying in the chat, there's a decided jump in Bitcoin activity in Argentina and Russia 
is necessity driving adoption. Yeah, I have to tell you, if I were in Argentina or if I were in Venezuela, I would really be um, trying to get my hands on some Bitcoins. I mean, uh, certainly people also be trying to get their hands on some US dollars, but it is certainly in countries where the currency unit is badly managed, the Bitcoin as a currency and the Bitcoin as a currency model uh, certainly becomes more relatively appealing versus currencies like the US dollar and the euro that are pretty good most of the time. Russia is a somewhat different story and it's very interesting to see this in official circles. The Central Bank of Russia was extraordinarily negative about Bitcoin at the beginning. And then, as part of the increasing tension between Russia and the West, um, and possible sanctions and possible restrictions on the financial system and the payment systems, um, it started to soften. And I wouldn't read huge amounts into it that, oh my God, now Ru you know, I'm gonna say Russia is gonna use Bitcoin as a weapon against the West. Now, I don't think that necessarily, but I do think it's made them think more broadly about their dependence on international payment systems. They're adding new requirements on Visa and MasterCard in terms of how much processing has to happen in Russia. And it seems to have coincided with a significant softening on the official attitude toward Bitcoin. So I do think these... Um, I do think these things play a very big role. Uh, Simon says, so nothing could really kill Bitcoin at this time. That's a, very, that's a very strong statement to make. I think certainly eliminating Bitcoin completely would be extremely difficult at this point. You'd need a coordinated response by many, many jurisdictions and taking very, very aggressive action that no one has shown any particular sign of wanting to do. Um, kill it completely also is probably theoretically impossible, even in the worst case. All you need is a couple computers mining and Bitcoin still exists. It could be suppressed in its adoption. I mean, if major economies um, made it illegal, let's say, to build Bitcoin-based businesses, I think you'd be hard-pressed to get any mass consumer adoption. Now there's not any sign that any major developed economies want to do that, but it's certainly theoretically possible. So if you had to if you ask me for my own opinion, it seems like it's on a very good pathway, but I wouldn't say it's structurally impossible to prevent mass adoption. I think it probably is structurally impossible to make it go away. Uh, and uh, There's a significant distinction between those two. Okay, everyone, it is 8.02 here in Cyprus, so I am going to wrap this session up. First of all, I want to thank Alex for joining us today and coming up from, he was actually down in Larnaca this afternoon, so he came all the way to Nicosia uh, to join in, so I want to thank him very much for his time. Thank you for having me. And I want to wish all the rest of you a wonderful weekend. Uh, and hope you're doing something appropriately summery, uh, at least if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. And we will be back, uh, I guess, on the 4th, if I'm not mistaken, for the last session on Bitcoin in the developing world. So this wraps up session 11 of the University of Nicosia MOOC in Digital Currency. Thank you very much.